Hey, we're live Monday night, seven o'clock, and we got a special guest for you tonight. Kind of an OG in the catfishing world, Ryan Casey. We'll bring him on in just a second uh, while everybody's jumping on. Just want to talk about the Alton tournament this Saturday, stop number three for the Twisted Cat Outdoors tournament series. Uh, a few quick things. Friday night, we'll be at the Best Western Premier. That'll be our non-mandatory captain's meeting uh, from 5 to 8. You do not have to be there, but we'll go over rules, have some merch for sale. You can still register. Uh, registration after tonight will go up. So right now it's 315 online. After tonight, it'll be 340. You can pay 325 cash Friday night or Saturday morning or 340 uh, with a card uh, this Saturday or Friday night. Um, again, this is stop three, so points matter. Uh, we're about 35 teams signed up, so I know some people are going to probably jump on and sign up tonight before the price goes up. But uh, and again, if you have any questions about any of the events coming up, any of our past events, points, championship, any of that stuff, um, definitely ask in the comments. And uh, let's have fun tonight again. Ryan Casey with Show Me Catfishing. Um, we're going to like really dive deep see how he got started, what got him into the sport, and kind of how he's helped mold the sport of catfishing, um, whether it's tournaments, TV, uh, guiding, and all that fun stuff. So if you have questions for Ryan, um, he's not going to tell you probably where the fish are biting for this weekend, but uh, you know, ask in the comments. We'll get him answered. And again, we're just going to have some fun tonight. So without further ado, let's bring Mr. Ryan Casey on. How we doing, Ryan? Man, we're doing good. How's everything going over there? It's going good. So we were kind of joking this weekend at CapCon about uh, the podcast that I needed to get you on at some point, and we literally did it. I mean, like this Monday. So yeah, I wasn't expecting it to be that quick, but uh, you're a man of your word. <laughs> yeah. So what? Uh, I guess we'll kind of start with CatCon since we just had it. There were Catfish Crappie Conference. Um, what is your thoughts or what were your thoughts of it this year as it's grown and, you know, where it's came from, you know, what, and back when you kind of got started? I mean, it's, it's, I thought it was pretty spectacular for, you know, how big of an event it was this weekend. Yeah, it's, it's definitely grown a lot this year it was uh, smoother than last year, I think even. So I was at the, um, I don't know if it was the first one, but maybe the second one that was in that small little room that you could walk around and see everything in about 30 minutes. Um, you know, just a lot of really cool new products out there. You know, a lot of great rods, pretty much anything in the industry wants to see um, was represented. So, I mean, for somebody who loves the sport of catfishing, um, and even the crappie guys coming in and uh, all the equipment and tackle and new innovations uh, that were there. It's uh, it's definitely a must. You know, if you haven't gone and checked it out, you definitely should. Yeah, like I said, it's I remember I've been to every one uh, actually as a vendor. Uh, I set up the Twisted Cat booth at the very first one at that dealership in like the back in the marine shop, you know, in like a little 10 by 10. <laughs> I think where they had a bay where you could lift like cars up or something or some oil stains, but, uh, and then I went to the hotel uh, and then now it's at this big ex expo center. And like I said, it was, it was packed. There was a lot of people. Uh, it was a lot of fun. You know what I mean? It's uh, all you do is you just talk and you meet people. And like I said, it just from all walks of life, you know, we talked to people from Nebraska, Washington, DC, uh, just everywhere, Florida, South Texas, it's just crazy. I mean, everybody kind of comes together for this one event every year. Uh, and to me, it kind of kicks off the the season for the sport. So I had a blast Definitely. and, uh, yeah. It, it, and was it was good. Cool to see, yes. It, it was cool to see, you know, a lot of the bigger companies that I had and, um, water there. I mean, there was, you know, all kinds of companies to talk to the manufacturers and the, the reps themselves and, and kind of put, you know, faces to names, you know, people you haven't quite met yet from across the country and, and, you know, talk products. And it was, it was a pretty cool experience. So what was your, so, did I you mean, get to I walk have... around and, did you get to walk around and check things out? What would you say was like the coolest thing you've seen? 
Um, I mean, the coolest thing was probably you in that catfish costume that you were walking around. You, know, you did a great <laughs> job with those kids, buddy. But, um, you know, it was just an overall, the, the seminars they had, um, just getting to see old people that, you know, I, I, I don't normally get to see and, and meeting a lot of new people. That's probably my favorite part of the whole deal. Yeah. And it's, I was talking to Kevin Lakin actually, and it's, 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 he's right. Like you, you get to see a lot of people on social media and talk to them and comments and a little bit on the phone sometimes. But for the most part, this is the one time a year you kind of see everybody from different walks of life, whether they're a social media star or tournament angler or manufacturer. I mean, all of it. And, and even the products, you know, like the dragon master products, you know, the innovative stuff in our sport and, you know, getting to, you know, hang out on Airbnb with you for a couple of days and kind of pick your brain on, you know, where the sport is like when you got involved and where it's at now and, you know, different baits and tactics and all that stuff. Like I learned so much this weekend and there's so many interesting things. Uh, like I said, it's, it, it, it was a good, it was a good time for sure. Yeah. I mean, like we talked about, you know, a lot of the past in catfishing doesn't get brought up anymore. Um, you know, there's a lot of great new names in, in, in faces in the catfishing world. And, you know, a lot of, especially like us old, you know, guys, I'm 46, but I mean, there's guys that were in it a lot longer than me. And I know it surprised you when we were talking about Mike Mitchell, how long he's been in the sport. You know, I mean, he's, you know, he was a guide before I was, and, you know, I've been a guide for 14 years now or something like that. And, there's just a lot of those guys age and older that we're not as tech savvy as a lot of the new guys. We don't, uh, you know, we don't market ourselves as well. We're not in on all the, you know, electronics with putting stuff on social media and different platforms. So, you know, a lot of those guys are kind of forgotten except for, you know, they're around for a long time. And there's a lot of people that, you know, just kind of gone by the wayside that are big names who got, a lot of people like me and everybody else in the sport, you know, I, I don't think there's anybody out there hopefully that doesn't still know Phil King's name or John Jameson or, you know, but there's guys like Harold Dodd and big cat Patterson. And, you know, the list goes on Coughlin. Uh, I could name a bunch. We were talking about Jim Moyer, Virgil AG, you know, there's a lot of guys who got us into all of this, you know, the guys from men fishermen, um, you know, the list goes on who just aren't talked about much anymore. And it's a shame because they were kind of pioneers in our sport and got a lot of guys, even in my generation, interested in, in uh, all of this. And Mike Mitchell, you know, he's been, he's been around for a long time. He's still one of the greats. He's a great tournament angler. He's a great guide. Um, you know, yeah. we bring him, but, uh, you know, he deserves it. There's a lot of guys out there that do. And, and like we talked about, you know, at the Airbnb this weekend, and I got to learn about your history. Like, you know, I almost consider myself not an OG, but I've been in it a long time. I mean, well, not a long time, but 2012 is when I caught my first blue cat. You know what I mean? And once I got in, once I, once my buddy from work took me out, like it was just over from there. And to think that that's been a long time now, it's 2024. But, you know, if you go back, you know, it just, it, it gets like the Jim Moyer, you know what I mean? Like people that don't know that he came out with the boss rods, the <clears throat> number one, two, three, and four, and, and things like that. And the Phil King, I guess let's, let's go way back and let's start. Maybe you're out of high school. Kind of give us a little bit of history of how you got in with everything, how it all started. Well, um, I was a traveling salesperson and uh, I traveled across the country and, you know, when my son was about to be born, I, I kind of left all that and moved back home. And I, I freaking traveled a lot. Um, and, and I did a lot of trips in Florida. So I always fished off the bridges for catfish or I'm sorry, saltwater fish and things like that. all this kind of heavy equipment uh, tackle wise that um, I just kind of had sitting in the garage. And I didn't have a boat at the time, you know, so I, I, uh, I, I kind of brought that stuff out and did some bank fishing. That's how I got started, you know, losing flip flops and, and Mississippi river mud, uh, carrying bait buckets, you know, 
hundreds of yards, if not quarters of miles through the woods to, to get to some of these spots and lost a lot of, uh, tackle and, and, and shoes and stuff in the mud. And, and, you know, I finally decided I was going to get a boat. I was in a position to do that. So I went up to Wisconsin and bought this little center council boat and started fishing the river. And I mean, the very first trip out there, we landed a 60 something up at the Alton Dam. I was with my buddy, Aaron Kahili. I'll never forget it. Had a, I think it was an old TRX uh, hummingbird that had like the little fish uh, cracker symbols, the goldfish cracker symbols. You know, I had a big one and a little one on there. So we were fishing uh, what I did, what we call now is the hog trough, but uh, throughout the anchor and set up on this fish. And I caught a small one and my buddy Aaron hooked the 60 something. And, uh, you know, ever since then, it's just, you know, back. I, I started out just like probably most of y'all started out. Um, I was hungry. You know, I wanted, I laid up at night thinking about how I could catch these things better. They, you know, they took over my whole mind. That was my whole mindset was how I can catch these things better. I mean, they're addicting. You know, all you I have so many and people who come fish with me that, uh, you know, I'm a bass fisherman, this and that. And once they get, to feel the i mean it's the closest thing we have to saltwater fishing these things pull hard they're big um they're finicky so i mean it's it's there's all different kinds of techniques you can use to catch them i mean they're just an awesome game i mean it's like guys who go out and chase tarpon or anything else these things are spectacular for freshwater fish so they consume my whole mind you know back then i used to lay up at night and think about ways i could catch them better i mean you know, 14, 15, 16 years ago, I was trying spinner blades and uh, rattles and you name it um, but with my buddy Rick Bracken, who I actually started Show Me Catfishing with. Um, you know, he's he's a barge captain and he's long since discovered you can make a whole lot more money being a barge captain than a, than a catfish <laughs> guy. So, but, um, you know, he was a smart one, but here I am. People ask me if I'm ever I'm like, I'm not smart enough to do anything but fish. So that's where we're at and I enjoy it still. So, um, but you know, catfishing is, it, it's a passion and it's something to get underneath your skin. And, you know, and I do it enough now. It doesn't, you know, keep me up at night thinking about new, but what I do have is, you know, almost 20 years of experience being out on that river and, um, you know, getting to see the patterns over the years and, times of the year that kind of give me a little bit of an edge over, you know, some of the guys that are just, you know, putting it all together. But um, there's just, it's an awesome sport. That's all I can tell you. Um, I love it. And, you know, getting started back then, you know, going back to what we were talking about, you know, I, I got that boat. And then the next thing you know, I started getting into tournaments. And um, that's another aspect of fishing. Once you kind of you, know, you you get to where you feel like you can catch them and next you want to you want to kind of test your skills against everybody else's you know back then we had the boc the brotherhood of catfish and uh, then was known as catfish one after that and that's how a lot of the guys in our area you know they ask how do you know that guy well you met you met him on catfish one that was before facebook you know now everybody's kind of um you know, put in and the, you know, there's groups you can join and different pages yeah. and stuff. Back then it was just the brotherhood of catfishing. You remember those days? Yeah. So actually funny story, Eric Simcox uh, asked me to be on a podcast with him and he is like the, the brotherhood of catfishing. Um, yep. And we were watching some of his videos the other night, but uh, yeah, I was on his, his it, which was on Twitch, which I don't know nothing about Twitch, but I got to go with him on Twitch and that was fun. And, the videos that we were watching the other night. What was the song? Can you sing that song? That we're playing? I mean, I don't want to butcher it because you don't want to hear me sing, but <laughs> Catfish in America. <laughs> yeah. Just I got to find it. it, but no. I mean, those <laughs> videos, I, I, until like the last few weeks, I can't watch. I, like, I wasn't into YouTube videos and like watching them and all that. Like, now I'm going back and watching like the Catfishing America stuff. I've got your monster. It that's video pulled up right here like that stuff is is awesome like the it's, music it's and, and the excitement the excitement those guys have yeah if you want to go back and watch when like guys like john jameson and i still had a full head of hair um mike mitchell was a skinny young man at Jackson. i mean they're gold 
and they're on there. They're out there if you want on them down. Oh, when you – yeah, the video we watched with Mike Mitchell, and again, and, and that's my own fault. I mean, I've actually fished with Mike Mitchell. I fished against him. I know him pretty well. I thought he ain't been in it that long. And he's oh, no. like been in it a long time. And he looked like he was 12 in that video you showed me. And he, <laughs> he looked just like that. Yeah. 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 yeah um, he's, he's been in it a long time. And there's, you know, there's a lot of guys like that. But, um, you know, it's. Uh, <laughs> did you see that? Uh, I see Scott Tunage. I can't read it. Uh, he said, Ryan knocked off my biggest cat ever one night on the Missouri. That's bull. I can tell you that story exactly how it happened if you want to hear it, uh, Scott. So I'm retying Scott's fourth or fifth rig that he had, you know, uh, got snagged up and I was his rig, handed him my left handed rod, and we're right getting ready to hit the confluence. And I swear to God, he had the biggest fish. I'd probably, I'd be famous if he had caught that fish. Uh, but instead, the fish takes off and I mean, it's peel and drag and Scott gives it some kind of handed left. Uh, I don't know what you could, it's not a hook set. And uh, that fish gets off and there's like five or six foot, maybe 30 foot of slime. I don't know. It was huge up the line. It was probably, you know, three inches thick. It was the biggest fish probably ever would have been caught. Um, and he just, you know, broke my heart that night. And then, so it's Scott's fault. Oh, 100%. 100%. If that fish would have hit while I still had the pole, I mean, they'd still, they'd still be singing songs about that show, you know? <laughs> so, about get, it. In, get into, you know, like uh, what, we, what we were talking about, you know, so you're, you're getting into the tournament. So, start kind of how the tournament started, which led into the TV. Well, um, we got into tournaments, and I want to tell you guys, if you're thinking about taking the next step in catfishing, tournament fishing, the tournament Alex runs, uh, he runs a top-notch tournament. That's something that will take your fishing to the next level. Because, I mean, you don't have to win them. Just be out there. You get to see how other people are fishing after the tournament. I mean, everybody's, you know, fishing their best stuff, their best techniques, using what bait they should be for that time. And there's just a lot to learn from tournaments. You know, um, we started off fishing tournaments and, uh, you know, we're lucky enough to get a big fish and, and, and play some money, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, you learn a lot from tournaments, you know, just the talking afterwards and kind of, even back when I started really tight lipped, like people didn't say much, but, uh, you can really pick up a lot from the sport on, on, uh, on tournament fishing and it's, it's a good learning experience to kind of take you to the next level. But, um, you know, back then when I was, uh, an outside salesman and got my boat, I used to sleep on the river. I wasn't married or anything at the time. So I would sleep out on the river. I would, you know, come home, take a shower and go to work, you know, at five or six o'clock in the morning. I mean, I lived out there. I was hungry, you know, and that's one of the biggest things if you're going to, um, you know, kind of take your fish into the next level is time on the water and there's no replacement. Um, you can take a guy like me out. Like if I would have been smart, I could have probably saved myself a lot of time and money and gone down and take a guided trip with Phil King and probably learned, cut my learning curve a lot, um, you know, and saved a lot of money. But uh, if you have that advantage to spend the time on the water, I mean, there's no, you know, there's no second to that. Um and then, you know, once I did that and I felt really confident in my ability to just catch fish while I was out there, because that's not, that's not an easy thing to do on a river. It's a constantly changing environment. You know, we don't have a pattern that usually sticks for more than a week. We're lucky. Um, so once, once I kind of started doing well in tournaments and knew that I could hang with pretty much anybody in my area and consistently put fish in the boat, um, I moved into, um, I'm going to start a guide service, you know, and at that time we were also filming monster. Which I took a year off work to film. Um, pretty much we, we filmed that for a year. And, uh, and, and basically if, if there was a shot that a fish was being, you know, any shot in that video, I was there, you know, I was either filming it, netting it or fighting it, you know? So, um, 
I took a year off of work to do that. And before I went back to the real world, I decided I'm, I'm going to go for it. I took a loan out, bought the first Sea Arc, uh, the Monster Cat boat, uh, the Sea Arc Pro Guide 240 that we were using in that and started my guide service. You know, I got lucky. I like Scott Tunage, uh, you know, he, he, he filmed the show with me my first year. I met Scott um, down snagging for Spoonbill with Steve Brown. He's a buddy of ours. We were, we were going to make a uh, Spoonbill snagging video uh, with Fat Cat Outdoors like we did for Monster Cats. And I met Scott down there and, you know, he called me up, said he saw that I was starting a guide service and, and gave me, threw me a bone, you know. I mean, he's one of the guys who got me off the ground and he's one of the nicest guys that, I mean, don't, I was going to go to his head, but Scott, you know, he's a, he's a good dude. So anybody who knows would back that up. And he's one of the guys who got, you know, showing me catfishing off the ground. My first year, I had two national shows fall on my lap. The other one was um, City Limits Fishing with Mike Iaconelli. And uh, I got a call from Scott Morrow. I think Scott Morrow or um, Chris Morrow, actually. Chris Morrow. Yeah, Chris. Uh, a good word for me with a producer at uh, City Limits Fishing uh, with Iaconelli. So Chris and, um, you know, he's another good buddy of mine I've known for a long time and you know, I, I had that show fall on my lap the first year and really kind of got show me catfishing off the ground. Yeah, he, he is. I, I watched a ton of those videos and they're actually for anybody that wants to go back and watch some of Casey's videos <laughs> with Scott, they're incredible. And, and like I said, even like the fish on the graph and like how you guys are fishing in the current, like all that stuff. And, and a lot of it seemed like we were putting it in Carothersville. Is that right? shows down there actually scott's from hay Tai, and um, oh i didn't know that more, okay yeah he's he's from down in the boot hill um that's why you could probably hardly understand him you know he's got that thick southern accent but uh he's you know scott what i liked about scott shows um you know he put it on like he's the expert he always you know he always pumped the guy up you know like he would say ryan and, and he'd always do it in a in a crazy way he'd have the camera in your face with eric uh the land you know the grain baron uh was his camera guy and uh he would always just put the camera in your face you know and and just on the spot like but he would always you know he wouldn't take any of the credit he would just you know basically give all the credit to the guide and uh you know kind of just pump all his guides up and let people know that this this is you know all on them you know win or fail yeah you know that's why he was such a good host for so many years yeah you got a lot to what <clears throat> kevin said learned a lot from ryan's videos still a lot more to learn <laughs> well rough i mean on now. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good time and i owe a lot to those um i've made a living at doing this and those guys are a big part of it so but i mean you you won a boat right you you had uh, angler of the year for a couple of years um yeah we won three boats um three we boats won angler, three boats i won one with jackson i won one with uh two with my dad and um you know, we had we had a really good run while we were fishing tournaments. And, you know, I loved tournament fishing back then. But then, and I don't know, you know, I have a lot of respect for guys like, and I, we keep bringing his name up, Mike Mitchell, who guide full time and still are hungry for the tournament fishing. Because I will tell you, anybody who wants to become a guide out there, I still love it. It's the best you know, it's the best job I've ever had. I love watching people catch their biggest fish. It gets me pumped up. Um, you know, I start up, but if I get a day off, I'm most likely not in that boat catfishing, you know, and it, it does take something you love and turns it into a bit of a job, but it's the best job I've ever had. I'm not complaining by any stretch of the means. So don't take it like that. It's just now when I get time off, like fish a tournament and I get, four days off to go do it i'm not near as hungry or as mad at them as i used to be you know i used to they used to keep me up at night thinking about new ways to catch these jokers and now that i fish for them every day um i'm just not near as mad at them as i used to be you know 
Um, and when I get four days off, I want to go hang out with, you know, guys like, you know, the Massey Gills, Joe Lunsford, Aaron Jarrell, all my buddies that, you know, I don't get to see and, uh, you know, and, and, and have a good time and go catch some fish. I don't usually get to fight fish when I do. I'm pretty out of shape. I'll tell you that right now. Um, and, you know, it's just more about fun and having a good time. But you not only, I mean, that you have several people that guide for you. So, I mean, it's not just you out there. I mean, you've got like a team and, and you've taken some anglers from Twisted Cat that, that fish the series like Joe Lunsford and, and soon uh, Nathan uh, or, or Wally Meyer uh, just actually got his license. I know Nathan was talking about getting his license. And then uh, your dad used to guide too for you. Yeah. Um, when I first started out, um, you know, I was guiding and dad fished. When he moved back and retired, he actually came back and was fishing tournaments with me. And I kind of had to train him. Shout out to Dennis Casey. Um, I had to train him on catfish. And he's the one who taught me how to fish. But I actually showed, you know, taught him how to catfish. And um, excuse me, my cat's attacking my tripod here. Um, you know, I showed him kind of, you know, the catfishing world and how to do it. And, you know, he and I were very very good with tournaments because we you know we we fished enough together throughout my whole life so but um you know dad dad actually came and guided for me for several years before you know he 65 67 somewhere in there he um he just kind of was like you know it's, it's getting too much for me we don't have any ramps or uh docks on the ramps and things like that and fishing the river is pretty demanding so you know, he just kind of backed away from that. And then I, I was fortunate enough to have, you know, two really, um, well, three actually in, um, Russ DeVore, Mark Farrow and, um, and, you know, Tyler Moses, those, those guys, I can't say enough about them. They're awesome fishermen. They're and it, you know, you can't just be an awesome fisherman when it comes to guiding. You also have to be a pretty personable person. You know, you have to be able to entertain people and, you know, just kind of make the day enjoyable, even when the fish is slow, because ultimately you're going to have those days. And those guys, you know, nobody works for show me catfishing. We, we all are show me catfishing. You know, I just want to clear that up. Nobody works for, we're all kind of partners. You know, I learned a long time ago when I started this, I, you know, you can only do what your schedule allows you to do. So ultimately, you know, I was turning people away. I was booked almost a year out and people would call me wanting to fish that week or the next month or whatever. And you were, I was like, are you kidding me? I, I, I don't have anything until, you know, six months from now. And, and my dad, you know, I had him booked very similar. So I was basically turning people away to ultimately start other guide services. So, you know, I just thought, you know, I might as well keep this catfishing and bring some of my buddies in who I know are good fishermen who people will enjoy and that's you know kind of the thing they have to fish with me um I'll go out and first mate for them or they'll they'll first mate for me several times and we're just going to kind of make sure they're they're the kind of guys that we want with show me catfishing they're they're you know good people they're not you know they don't have any big character flaws and they can catch fish, you know, at all times of the year. That's pretty much our criteria. And, um, you know, we help train them up and, and, you know, the guys that I, you know, got right now, you know, Joey, Wally, they're, they're awesome. Yeah. You got, and like, it's like you said, it's a team thing. You got a good team. Adam said, my first trip was with captain Tyler. I'll never forget it. Helped me get into the sport. I still reference back the things I learned on that trip. So, I mean, Again, you do have a great team. I got to go with Tyler once, and each – I mean, I know all your guides real well, and they're all great, uh, you know, got great personalities, can catch fish, and it, you know what I mean? But most importantly, having a personality is a big deal when you got when you got to spend time with somebody all day that you don't know. You know? Yeah, and, and, and Tyler, you know, that's – that one's going to sting for a while because, I mean, and we're real happy he's – you know, moving down to do some saltwater guided down there because his, his, um, you know, future wife or girlfriend, you know, took a job down there. And um, he's one of the most natural guides I've ever met. You know, he just, he's a smart guy, really good fisherman. Um, so we're going to miss, 
but uh you know never know he might he might come back one day when if they might move back up here you never know but um until then if any of our guys who have fished with tyler you know know how good he is if you all are ever in the alabama area down by the ocean give give tyler a call and we'll be we'll be posting up his when he gets everything set up down there and making sure everybody knows how to contact him yeah, and like I said, you don't just – I guess where all do you – tell people where all you cover because it's not just St. Louis. Well, you know, we we fish the Missouri, um, you know, the Mississippi and the St. Louis, Alton. Um, when the water gets low or the fish dictate it because, you know, sometimes the water will get low and we'll have a bunch of our fish move down south or sometimes in the spring if we think we need to be in the boot hill down around Carothersville, New Madrid. We'll fish down there. Um, Captain Russ and Tyler always like to kind of take a, you know, it, it's just a vacation fun trip where we would take all the crew and we'd go down to Alabama and fish Wheeler or Wilson. And um, we had clients that started wanting to go. So they, they started, it was just kind of a fun deal where we'd rent a house and run some trips to pay for the, you know, the, the whole trip. And, and now Russ goes down there and fishes every fall in October on Lake Wilson or Wheeler and takes a bunch of people down there. And, you know, they have a good time. And uh, Wally's talking about possibly doing New Orleans or something like that this fall. And, um, yeah, I mean, we're licensed to guide anywhere in the country. Uh, Mitchell comes up here and runs some trips. And, you know, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's a good deal. We, we can take our customers and, um, you know, show them different parts of the country, you know, put them on some great fishing. So I, I, we're not trying to take away from anybody else's, you know, uh, guide trips where they, I mean, we're bringing our customers up here from St. Louis and taking them with us on these trips. So it's, it's not like we're cutting anybody's throats or coming to somebody's water, trying to take over their business. Yeah, 100%. So I, I don't want them to think that. So we also, <clears throat> as we're talking about Mike Mitchell a lot lately, uh, we talked about, you know, we started this ACA one-on-one -on -one or what my son calls 1v1. Uh, and we, yeah. we talked about you and Mike Mitchell and especially like it hit, it hit better like knowing that you, both of you are so the OGs, you know what I mean? And, and been doing it for a long time. You guide, you guys are great tournament anglers, great personalities. So, I would love to see it. Obviously, we talked about it. What's your thoughts on doing a one-on-one -on -one with Mike? I mean, it was really weird being at the Catfish Conference because they're Mike and us are just kind of like two guys sitting at opposite ends of the bar who are friends, and you got this guy, like, you know, hey, that guy just called you this, and going over to him being like, hey, that guy just said you can't fight worth anything. So that's kind of what it felt like. But um, I talked to Mike, and I told him if he was – you know, wanting somebody to fish against needed somebody I, I'd fish against him. I mean, we're friends. I've got, you know, but I mean, that's a pretty cool. Um, I'd like for you guys to pick somebody who isn't quite as good as Mike for me, but uh, if that's the way it's got to be, um, you know, it's, it's a crazy good tournament. I like, I haven't tuned into it several times, you know, that you've had it. Haven't got to watch a full one because I always have something going on on a Saturday, but um what I have watched, it's it's really entertaining. Like, I love the format of it. So, it's a lot of pressure for the anglers. I mean, nobody wants to sit there and watch Mike Mitchell catch, you know, 200-something pounds to their, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, I think it would be a I think it would be a good mix. I would, I would love to see it somewhere in neutral territory south on the Mississippi – where I don't normally guide, you know, somewhere down there where, you know, you can bump or spot lock or, you know, and, and, and have a chance at some big fish. I think entertaining show. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to get something put together for that. I think that'd be fun. Yeah. Very entertaining. Like I said, a lot of, I mean, people can learn and see firsthand, you know, you fishing, how you're rigging, all that stuff. You know what I mean? Mike Mitchell Absolutely. said, yeah, let's do it. Excited. He's always been one of the best in the country. Will be a blast. Yeah, and I, I got to. So I was the, I guess, captain in in my boat when Mike fished against Brian and you know did the weighing and the video stuff. And it was it was fun, you know, um, being a part of that. Like it was even the general rush for me 
being in the boat, even though I'm not fishing, you know what I mean? So it's, it's exciting. And the thing is like you, it, you know, this Saturday, if there's 60 boats and you get, if you get beat up, it's fine. Like it's not a big deal, but right. when it's one on one, like you can't give up, you gotta be all in. Yeah. yeah and I mean, it's, it's gotta be disheartening when the other guy throttle you and, and you, you know, you, you have to be responsible and come up with a plan and and keep your composure which has got to be tough to do so um yeah i mean we I, we just seen brian for the first time after his one-on-one with mike at catcon i mean he went into hiding for several months i i do i mean it's a it's it's a tough format and it could happen to yeah. any we've all had those days where nothing is working i mean i know and nothing against brian i know i'm sitting there screaming at the the camera like quit moving my <laughs> quit moving brian just sit there you know throw some lines out but you know he caught him really good on friday and we've all been caught on that trap you know what what worked just yesterday you know or the day before so but i mean that's all part of it and that's i think what makes that format so stressful really <laughs> i mean it's got to be stressful i haven't been in it before where you're like you know you can't be like well my partner's group because <laughs> you're you, you don't no. have that. <clears throat> you can't blame it on nobody but yourself. And it, I mean, you have, you have nobody to lean on. I mean, no one, not your partner. I mean, you're yep. it's all you and that's what's fun about it. So we're going to work on that. We're going to get a date, get something put together. Uh, that'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I want to be the Ryan's amateur. So let's kind of get back to like the catfishing America days you know the boc as you're as you're in that you're making monster cats so kind of go over again like you made a whole season how'd that all start um we we were really just set out to make the best catfishing dvd on the market you know a lot of the other companies like catfish in america and in fishermen they made you know great catfishing content but it was usually just go somewhere, film a weekend, make a James River sequence, uh, you know, Canada sequence on the Red River, that kind of thing. We wanted to do um, takedowns. We wanted to show the takedowns, the full experience. And, you know, it was it was a great project. Um, at least the owners of it, including myself, had kind of a falling out. Um, I got cut out of a lot of the editing parts of it which I won't go into but I really felt like it could have been the best DVD ever made if there would have been more um, information and b-roll and thing into it to make it um, ultimately more informational but um, there was a lot of great content in it uh, as far as you know video footage of fish being caught takedowns and things like that which made it awesome I wasn't a fan of the the ultimately the the soundtrack, you know, so it, was, it was just one. It really bluegrass. wasn't a scene; it was just a DVD. It right. was. It was a DVD that just needed a whole lot more information and stuff, but was kind of thrown together. Um, which okay, so you know, that's the OG though. I mean, that's I'm looking at it 14 years ago. This was posted, and you're in a, you're in most of this. So can I, can we play like two minutes of this? Absolutely. Monster Cat. That's a teaser video so, that we stayed we stayed up until five o'clock in the morning, myself and John Warden, to take that to Robin at Sea Arc to uh, get a sponsorship for a boat. And that's that's the teaser video you're about to watch. So this is what you took to Sea Arc to get a boat sponsorship yep. for the DVD. You got it. That's crazy. And so what year well, was this event? This, this is this is after the original one we expanded on it with the boat in it, but we took her a version of this that doesn't have boat at the beginning and stuff. And, uh, and, so, and, and, and for those of you that don't know, Robin was the president of CR owner of CR boats back in 2000. What would this have been? Um, this was probably made in 2007, 2008, something like that. So 2000, 2007, 2008. Okay. So I'm just going to play just a few, just two minutes of this teaser and kind of show everybody kind of what, what, uh, how good Ryan was at editing and maybe he'll have to get back at it. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I was terrible. But, um, you know, there's there's a lot of guys that uh, made it possible. And, you know, Jason Jackson being one of them. Um, okay. Let's Chris Morrow's in it. Chris Mar yeah, there's a lot of people I know in it. Let's uh, see what everybody thinks. Just let us know in, your, in the comments. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Wow. Takes me right back. I'll tell you, all I can say is you've been around more big fish than probably about anybody. Been fortunate, man. That that was a tight group, though, man. That was uh, that was a good good time of my life, right there. Yeah, that's that's yeah, Mike wild. Mitchell, man. Mike Mitchell actually uh, took us out a bit for the Monster Cats uh, DVD and uh, didn't get shown, and uh, he's another one who was in that video. Who you know, I don't I don't know if he ended up making the final cut on that or not. Showed showed the whole group quite a bit about Wheeler Lake. Yeah. So Mike was Jason living Chris down Chris. in Alabama. Yeah. So Mike was down in Alabama guiding at that time. He was. Yeah. He, he's had Southern Cats for quite some time. Uh, Jason Bridges actually, I think, started with Mike back then. And uh, you know, now there's a lot of good guides down there. Josh Brown, J.R. Hill. You know, there's there's quite a few good guides that way. So, Mike, if you're watching, uh, tell us what year you started guiding. Uh, I, I remember, actually, Jason Bridges. I don't think he guides anymore. I don't think he, you know, he, I think he hung it up, took like a city job or something like that. Another really good tournament angler, catfish guide. Uh, a lot of people saw to see him go. Yeah. So that, so that was the video. That was the video that kind of got you going, got into the, the Sea Arc deal. And it looks like yeah. Steve Henderson put, <clears throat> Robin only agreed to a boat because she thought Ryan was so cute. <laughs> I'll take it. You know, I, I wish she was still around. I'd probably, you know, get a better deal than I'm getting from Henderson. <laughs> I'm just kidding, yeah. Henderson. Henderson, you heard that. No, she, she was uh, she was really cool. And, and that, was, that was a wild experience, you know, some – some guys from Missouri. Um, but you know, it's, you know, not to shamelessly plug them, but that's the deal with Sea Arc, man. They, if they think something's good for the sport of catfish and they're, they're going to stick behind it and risk some money. They're, they're the best, in my opinion, the best company. And I think a lot of people's opinion, the best company out there throws the most money into our sport. And, um, I know I'm wearing a Sea Arc shirt, but, uh, it just always upsets me beyond belief when guys start trash talking them online. And I'm just like, what are you, these, these guys put more money into our sport than every boat company out there combined. And you're trying to throw shade on them. It, we all need to kind of get together in the catfishing world and kind of support each other and all ban against those pay Lakers. <laughs> but, you know, we all want to fight amongst each other, just like everybody else in fishing you know, especially in the winter time when nobody's out there actually fishing. So um, I'm going to get off my soapbox now, but that's my two cents on it. No. And, it, and like I said, that's what it's about is, you know, the, getting together and, and working together and sea Arc's done a ton for the industry. Um, yeah. And like I said, and, and uh, stop cutting each other down. That's what Palmetto said. So Mike said started in 2004 part time. Wow, yeah. I was in my senior year of high school in 2004. Yeah. He, he says, I didn't make the cut on Monster Cat DVD, but was in a boat next to y'all when Cuz caught a big one. I mean, he, he goes back, man. He, and he was, uh, Jackson and I got into his boat, and uh, he took us up to the dam, and uh, one of those clips made the, you know, made the teaser there. I mean, Mitchell was in it, too. You know, they they kind of cut him out in the in the editing process, but uh, yeah, he was definitely there. I've known Mike for a long time. Yeah, I uh, I actually have just a quick little just um, it's a teaser that I accidentally found while just a few minutes ago while that other video was playing. It's got oh, our favorite good. song. This should be the song if if catfish the sport of catfishing has a song. This is it right here, uh, and <laughs> uh, and it's got Mike Mitchell in it. So I'm not um, singing karaoke or anything like that, am I? I don't think so. But we're gonna All hopefully right. this song. I'm not sure it's a song, but let's play this just real quick so everybody knows what we listen to. Probably over 150 times on Saturday night. You ready? I Can guess you handle so. it? I, I, feel, I feel like I know where this is going, but yeah, let's do it. All right.
like, yep. I did see river the Mississippi but no other place that I wish I was. Oh, how river of big, big lake. The rest of the world's gonna have to wait while I'm catfishing America. You just don't get better than this. This time on Catfish in America, we're going to the great state of Alabama to Colbert County's own Sheffield. And Sheffield sits on Pickwick Lake and Wilson Lake, two of the best catfishing impoundments of the Tennessee River you can find on the map. Now, Pickwick Lake is about 30,000 acres of shoreline, a little bit shallow. There's grassy areas, there's a lot of feeder creeks, excellent fishing, and usually some pretty good current. Then there's Wilson Lake, much deeper. There's parts of Wilson Lake that are over 115 feet deep. Some, some Cabela's tournaments, some local tournaments have been won on Wilson, and some have been won on Pickwick, depending on the time of year. Fantastic catfishing opportunities in either lake, again, depending on the season that you're, that you're visiting. But talk about the things you can do here in the Sheffield area. You've got great dining. You've got great water sport opportunity. And in nearby Tuscumbia, you've got the Alabama Music Hall of Fame and the birthplace of Helen Keller. Nice museum there to go and check out. So plenty of things to see, plenty of things to do, and, of course, great catfishing, some of the best on the planet. So when we come back, we're going to get out on the water and show you what catfishing in this Sheffield area is all about. Stick with us. Me and Dawn are going to head out here in the water now and get some skipjack that we all use for them catfish. And then a little bit later on, Dawn's going to be out with Mike Mitchell, catfish guy, tournament pro here in the Sheffield area. And they're going to get you some great catfishing action. The oh, skipjack yeah. capital of the world here in Sheffield. Look at that. Perfect size, too. Good job, Eric. Yeah, let's get that in. The best catfish bait ever made, right there. Skipjack herring. Now this is about 11 inch, and and this is my favorite size. It seems like uh, the head, which most people like to line, but it, it ain't too bad. Who's this guy wow. here? Holy cow! That's old Mike. That's Jackson Mitchell, isn't it? Wow, he has been in the sport a long time. I this is so, so he crazy. Came right around that line, didn't he? Yep. Yep. Mike's been he famous for a long time. He is. Probably ten. Yeah, yeah. Ten Breaking pounds. the ice. Ten and pounds. no way at all. Just letting that head just drift yeah. around, huh? I like to fish He's like that. You know, a lot of times they ain't just right on the bottom, and that movement of the bait seems like it does the trick. A lot of times, it's more natural to them. And how big of a skipjack head was that? Pretty it big. was, uh, yeah, yeah, pretty good size. Probably about as big as he could get in his mouth. I'd say, wow. you know, a good five, six ounce chunk of bait. Man, wow. I guess that's why they grow so quick, man. And, you know, eating yeah. big baits, man. Wow, that's a pretty fish. Nice start. Yep. Nice start. All right. Good job. Oh, my. Yeah. I mean, I, I told Jackson, I was like, I... It, your dad looked just like you when he was younger. Yeah, that's All those crazy. shows, man, that's you look crazy. back, I had a visor on with like a full head of, you know, mane of hair. And uh, it, it's a little depressing to look back and watch those. The only thing better than these videos is, you know, I think, is it the Catfishing Dream Team with Phil and the Massagills yeah. and Haney and all that? Yeah. Brad Stout did that. Brad, yeah, and, uh, wow. Yeah. Jason I'm and Phil Massingale were sponsored by Abercrombie and Fitch, 100%. Oh, guaranteed. Yeah. yeah. I never, I mean, cargo shorts like that, that's impressive. 
Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I don't think we saw their feet, but I'm betting Birkenstocks and uh, rocking yeah. them. So, you know, at <laughs> Jason Cotton Dockers Massengale. Uh, so, at the very end of this podcast, I'll play that for everybody again. But, like I said, I've kind of, like, I don't really watch YouTube stuff um, unless I need to, like, figure out how to change an alternator in a 2011 Toyota Corolla or something. But, I'm going to like, I am into this last night going to bed. I was watching this old stuff and it's really, really, there's a lot of great content that you can learn yes. from like what you're doing with, uh, even on this catfishing America show, which I will tell you that that song, I cannot get out of my head. It's a, it's a catchy jingle, once, man. Once you hear it a few times, you, yeah. you kind of start wish, singing it. <laughs> I wish we wouldn't open that can of worms the other night at the, at the house, but, uh, it, it gets stuck in there. Yeah, it's probably worse than that Baby Shark song. Oh, definitely. But, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to be learned, and there was, you know, that we didn't have, you know, all this stuff when, um, you know, now we were talking about this earlier as far as the tournament catfish world when, when like, when I first got started and a lot of – the information wasn't out there. Everybody kept it secret. You'd have guys cutting up their bait in the cover of darkness at night and putting it in bags before a tournament and – I mean, you didn't know what they used. They wouldn't talk about it, um, even to their own partners if they weren't your regular partner. It was it was really secretive. Um, so when you got out there and nobody talked about, you know, like we were some of the first or the first bump in this area, um, you know, Parfit says different, but, uh, we, you know, it's Parfit. So who knows? Parfit. Shout out Parfit. <laughs> but, um, oh, you know what? You, you talk know, about bumping. Tell, tell us that. Can you kind of gave me the story about was it a tournament that you and Warden kind of were when you learned how to do it or and and you wouldn't telling anybody? Yeah, oh, we we would we wouldn't even tell Cuz like uh, you know John Allen. So that was the day that I kind of left my job and and went uh, to to film full time for Monster Cats and we went out pre fishing. And Warden back then, no motors on their boat. I mean, he had one of the first side scan. Uh, I think it was the Humminbird 1197 or something like that. I mean, 11 inch side imaging. Nobody in the area had it. Uh, nobody back then hardly had trolling motors. So, you know, here we are. We we hop into the boat. We go into Joachim, some uh, you know big head and Asians. You know, the the size like you know about like that right there where you cut the heads off, you know, just in front of the dorsal. And, um, you know, we went out and there was one spot. And, and I told him like that day, we need to learn how to, to, to drift and bump for these things heard about it, but we have never seen anybody do it or, you know, knew how to do it, but we kind of had an idea in our head of how to do it. So we took the troll motor and we just went with cutting the current in about half. And I had this area that I'd always wanted to, try it at because i could never get my anchor to hang 50 something foot deep it was sand it was boils and i could never anchor up there but i always marked big fish in the summertime so we went in there and i mean i didn't have my bait in that we're bumping with i had a surge elite with like a abu seven or ten thousand i mean you'd have, I, we had arm muscles because i mean we were bumping with this huge gear and um you had no idea what we were doing but um, he had a catfish safari rod and we went down through there. And I think the first five minutes I, I hooked an 18 pounder and I was like, well, shoot, this is easy. And um, the very next fish we bumped out, I was to the front of this dike and had one hit it and caught a 41. And then it wasn't five minutes later, John hooked a 72. And I think we had 177 pounds in our biggest five in one pass. And it was like taking candy from a baby because these fish in our area really hadn't seen it before. And so it was just super easy. And, um, you know, we won a lot of tournaments with that technique because obviously, you know, even after guys picked it up, we kind of, you know, we were getting better and better. It's something that takes, a, you know, practice and time on the water to kind of perfect. So, I mean, we had to start on a lot of the guys in this area and, um, you know, now the, the tournament world is, it, it's such an even playing field out there. You know, all the information's out there. You have some really great anglers who all know what they're doing. 
and are pretty effective on a lot of different bodies. You know, back then it was, you know, kind of everybody kept everything they could hush hush. And, you know, it was fun. It was, it was a, you know, a really fun time because if you learned something and had something new and there was a lot to be discovered, you know, you could kind of keep it to yourself. There wasn't, you know, an internet page of it or something on Facebook. So it was, it was a different time. It was different times, you know? Yeah. Cause now everything's on, just like Dieter said, the old school secret way better for the sport and the modern social media world exposure from YouTube. And, you know, just like this is really all you had back then is these old school videos, uh, which really did have a ton of information, <clears throat> you know, but now you have a ton of YouTube stuff and TikTok and Instagram and Facebook um, giving a lot of information out. But as and another thing that we talked about, I don't know if you want to get too deep into it, but like bumping, you know, dead sticking was was really good, you know, back then. Um, do you think that pressure over the years has has put, you know, there's less fish? Or do you think pressure, like we talked about in the bass world, has changed where they're learning, they're adapting, so their bite's different now, and they're not, you know, the dead stick is not as effective as it was 10 years ago. What's your thoughts on that? I, you know, I, I have stuff that I feel very strongly about on this situation. Um, you know, I've seen enough of it. I do not think there's as many fish as there used to be. I think there is a large group of fish that move up and down the Mississippi, I think, and the Missouri. I think they do travel. I think there's always fish that are going to be here. But overall, I mean, uh, we have the, you know, the commercial fishermen up here for the Pay Lakes. And I, I do think we mark a lot less fish. Um, you know, you used to be able to go over these sand dunes and in the humps, there would be 15, 20 foot stacked up. And I mean, you could almost count on, you know, as many rods as you had out when you went over one of those things that they were going to hit it. Now that's where the other part of this comes in. They absolutely learn. Um, and you can see it time and time. You know, you go to a new area like Greenville when, uh, George Young and those guys would go down there and it was just a slaughter fest. Um, you know, New Orleans this year, you know, where, where a lot of these fish haven't seen these new techniques. When we started bumping here, the fish hadn't seen it. I mean, it, like I said, it was like taking candy. It was, it was a natural presentation to a fish that hadn't, you know, they didn't know it was trap. Now um, they absolutely learn. Look at, I compare it to in the bass fishing world, um, the Alabama rig. When it first came out, these, these guys wanted to ban it in a lot of tournaments because it was so effective another tool in the bag you know um so once they've seen these presentations over and over and over again now you have to get more pure in your presentation and do things a little bit more refined and correct um, to get these fish to go and it's not near as easy as it used to be so they absolutely learn big fish more than others so i think you know a lot of times there's times where big fish are more vulnerable like before the spawn after the spawn um, when they're coming out of the winter time, um, these are the times when we catch a lot of big fish consistently, and it's because they're more vulnerable to their feeding patterns up, and and they're just more vulnerable vulnerable then. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a combination of things. I think fish um, they absolutely learn. Um, now we're kind of getting away from the drifting. Um, as much and doing more spot lock and we're kind of going more old school, but he's drifting now. And so I think, um, and that's one of my favorite ways to catch big fish in general. I mean, you know, putting baits in front of them for longer periods of time and giving them time to uh, come up and get them. It's, it's a really natural way, but I think they're kind of onto the drifting thing in, in the St. Louis area. They, it, St. Louis, a ton of pressure. So, yeah, I, I think it's a, a culmination of things. I think it's, you know, obviously um, pressure. Um, I think commercial fishing has more to do with it now that, um, you know, a lot of these guys are moving outside of the Ohio and moving into some of our areas and plus more pe people interested in the sport taking fish for food, which I do not have a problem with. I just really encourage you all to to think about selective harvest, you know, 10 pounds and under, there's a ton of those to feed yourself with, let the big fish go for somebody else to, uh, you know, to enjoy. 
that's my personal preference, but if the law do what you want. But um, I do have a problem with commercial fishermen who uh, catch these things for pay lakes. Regular commercial fishermen are just out making a living, but I think putting these things in a pay lake is one of the most despicable things you can do. And I'm totally against it. So that's my take on that. But back to what what's you your thoughts? These of, fish, what's your thoughts of stopping that? I mean, I've been stopped. fighting this battle since 2006. Um, I'm not near as vocal as I used to be um, just for time. But I mean, I've done presentations in front of the conservation department and brought to it to their attention since 2006. You know, it's like taking and going into a state park and, and uh, trapping a bunch of deer that are, you know, 130 or 40 and above and taking them to a high fence operation for them to kill. Um, you know, these fish don't survive in these small bodies of water. My personal opinion is if you don't want to, if you're Ohio or the Department of, you know, uh, you know, wildlife in one of these states and you don't want to outright ban somebody's living, um, they have formulas for this. It's called carrying capacity. So you take a body of water, you take its depth, its overall size, and, you, and the forage that's in it to feed these fish. It's in what poundage of fish can survive in that environment. So if you have these pay lakes that are two acres, eight foot deep, and there's no food in them, there's no carrying capacity to hold a predator like a blue cat in it. But let's say you have something that's, let's, let's, make them build something that actually can sustain these fish and they have to hold true to their carrying capacity. And maybe, maybe they can stock that a year or they go in and they have to pay to have their lake shocked up and, and find what's in there forage wise versus, you know, predator fish. And that's what they can hold. Then at that point, I mean, I think they're going to go out of business. Anyway, people aren't going to be able to just go to a pond and, and catch a fish that's starving and about ready to die. You know, um, I don't hold the people who fish them, the pay lakes that are trophy pay lakes in high regard, and I don't hold the pay lakers in high regard. Um, it's not fishing. So I think if you did something like that to actually, they have to be responsible to manage their lake to hold enough forage for the fish that they're stocking in it, then they won't be taking our public resources in an unlimited, like, like it's an unlimited resource. I mean, that's what you ultimately, I think, have to do. It's a pretty easy process. They just have to come up with some kind of regulation or as a, um, you know, a task force or somebody who goes around and actually makes these guys be responsible for the bodies of water that they're charging people to fish. I think, you know, once they do that, I think everything would kind of fall into place. You're not taking somebody's livelihood away. You're just making them responsible for the waters that they're charging fish. And I think that's the only way I can see it going forward and, and, kind of benefiting everybody and making them responsible for uh, what they're doing. Cause what they're doing now is just, well, you know, 6,000 pounds of fish just died because there's no food for them in there and there's not <clears throat> enough water or oxygen to sustain them. And so we're going to go out and, you know, pay this guy, you know, three bucks a pound and this guy four bucks a pound and, and, and stock this lake like it's an unlimited resource. Cause it's not. Do you think as the sport continues to get bigger with, you know, bigger eyes on it, bigger companies, that that'll help us as a community push for more? It, it can only, I mean, you know, I like the ACA. I would really like to see them more involved with something like this. And I know that they dip their toes into it. And, but we need somebody who, because ultimately these guys are coming at all of our fisheries. You know, they've really kind of been cracking down a little bit on them on the Ohio. You know, West Virginia is doing great things. Uh, Tennessee is, um, you know, Missouri on the Missouri River doesn't allow for commercial fishing. And I'm not for taking away all commercial fishing of catfish because there's guys out there, you know, catching smaller fish and, and there's plenty of those out there. But I think the regulations for the 34, one over 34 inches per person per day and you know but you, you have to have fines that are you know not just a slap on the wrist that's the cost of doing business for these guys you have to go out there checking and and writing tickets and taking vehicles that that actually make it a hindrance for these guys because you know until those things change um nothing's going to change and it's 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 really 
a lot of these fit. I mean, look at the Ohio for all the guys out there, you know, have been around. We looked forward to a tournament on the Ohio river. You knew you were going to go get it on some big fish. That place was, it was a deep, slow river with plenty of forage and there were big fish everywhere. And it is not that way anymore. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> somebody brought up about even selling tags for everything trophy catfish. I mean, something to, to slow it down or to at least track it. Cause most there's really not any laws, I mean, especially if they're coming on the Illinois side, they can take a lot of yeah. fish. A lot yeah. Of fish. And I mean, unfortunately, um, you know, Illinois is probably one of the biggest hindrance to Missouri actually doing something because we have on the Mississippi and, you know, the, the state of Illinois, a lot of their fisheries guys are embedded in the commercial fishing world and uh, have a lot of strong ties to it. So, you know, I don't see anything changing on that front. I mean, they have a pretty big, uh, you know, they have a pretty deep and uh, some pretty influential people who have the ears of a lot of the people who make the policies over there. Yeah. Well, hopefully as the sport grows and we get more people in it and, and work together, I think, you know, like some of other states have, you know, I know Arkansas was trying, I'm not sure if it got passed or not, um, but it seems like a lot of people are, are – putting the effort in, you know, from Aaron Wheatley and, and Douglas. The Ace. I mean, whether it's, you know, one person can't do it. It takes a group of us, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all too busy fighting each other and saying, you know, this guy's not doing this or that or this group. You know, I mean, we all need to stick. We all love these fish. You know what I mean? We, we love to target them and we just let just <laughs> – you know, just like the whole country. I mean, we need to quit fighting each other and start fighting, you know, the same fight. And yeah. that's what I wish we'd do more of. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Well, that's, that's kind of got, and, and, and really, if you take the Mississippi, like you said, the Missouri doesn't allow commercial fishing, which I, I, I agree with you that I don't want to take that away for a guy that's going out there, you know, catching food for his family and making a living. But you know, it's made the Missouri River, the, in 10 years, only two fish that I've weighed over 100 pounds have came from the Missouri River. Yeah, we've we've caught several ourselves, and it's um, it's a phenomenal fishery. I mean, the commercial guys still get caught over there. It's not policed enough, and I don't think they have enough agents to police it correctly, and I don't think the fines are big enough to deter them. I, I mean, they're still catching them, um, you know, with their nets and stuff, but... Uh, overall it's had a, a great impact on the on the fishery i mean it's 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 an awesome awesome fishery yeah and, and again like making laws is great but if they're not enforced and if you don't have enough you know agents to enforce them and if it's just a slap on the wrist like a 25 five dollar fine for taking a load of fish is not going to stop anybody from doing that not one day. yeah it, it can be a it can be a 500 or a thousand dollar fine and it can be the cost of doing business for these guys if because uh you know last year out of the st louis area they were taking around twenty five thousand pounds a week that's the numbers i heard and i mean i saw them out there at least three days a week and they're fishing the same waters we were catching really big fish on and i watched them pull one over the side of the boat i couldn't tell you how big that fish was i mean it was a giant and those fish are, are going that's it, it was kentucky plate sure they're going into a holding tank or a holding pond and getting sold to the highest bidder, you know, um, those guys are out there and they're not letting up, you know, so they're, they've got, they've got ears, they've got eyes on Facebook of what you post and where you're posting it. And they're, they're, you know, they're coming to a state or a body of water near you. So watch what you post on there, make sure your backgrounds are clean and uh, watch you tell where you're catching your fish. Cause those guys are listening. Yeah, because, I mean, really, right now, what they're doing is not against the law. No, it's it's completely legal, and it shouldn't be. Um, you know, it's it's what they're doing. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, Wally said the fines are a joke anymore for breaking the laws, you know, in the, in the fishing industry. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not one for more, you know, I'm regulation or anything like that, but that's one thing I do feel like we need more regulations on. I don't understand how it's legal in the first place. Um, you know, like I said, if they had lakes that were equipped to 
you know, sustain the fish and, and they were actually, you know, had food in there to feed on, keep them alive and you were catching them, that's still fishing. But what they're doing isn't fishing. It's not even remotely um, ethical, you know. So, I mean, they're going around every morning scooping up dead fish and throwing them into a dumpster. If that's not wanton waste, which is against the law, I don't know what is. You know, you tell me. Yeah. I'm going to get off my soapbox think- now. Let's go to something a little more positive. All right. So let's let's go to – let's get, get back to – technique so the bumping the drifting that's changed you kind of talked about you know what you like to do now um so what what do you think's next what's coming to get these fish i seen kevin parks selling these giant i think they call them river boards so you think like i know some people dragging on the on the rivers now like what's your thoughts on that are they dragging up river have you tried any of that stuff I have, you know, I, uh, back in 2012, um, we were using planar boards to catch suspended fish in 50 foot of water, six foot down. I noticed some fish actually feeding on some dead carp that were coming through. And I, you know, would see these, I was dragging, you know, the slack water and all of a sudden, you know, this carp would come by that, a you know, tugboated hit and fish were, I saw 25, 30 pound fish, you know, tearing at it and pulling it down. And, um, you know, got some planer boards out that my dad had for walleye fishing and offshore tackle ones or something and went out there and was dragging six to eight foot, you know, under the surface and catching these fish out of water. It works. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I still, you know, I'll, I'll put my stacker rigs, um, you know, the Kentucky rig or whatever you want in June and stuff around the spawn um, in dead water and, and run live baits, you know, six, eight, 10 foot off the bottom on that stacker rig and catch some really big fish that way. There's all different kind of techniques, but none of them are, are really consistent. It's kind of something you play with when the regular stuff isn't working. But I do think that, I mean, you look at MRM and the, and the guys who were um, winning that, the back-to-back years dragging in the slack water or in between dikes. Oh, yeah. there's, there's definitely, you know, there's, there's always some new technique. I mean, I think most of it's been done, but I think there's situations um, that I think there's, there's guys like Hunter Jones and, and Chris Stout. I think they're doing something a little, you know, in lighter current with lighter weights, slowly presenting baits. Um, yeah, he's know, told me that. I don't know if I believe him. He, he always, he always tells me, yeah, little, yeah, I mean, little weight, know. little bait. He gave me a weight. It was like an eighth ounce or something. Yeah, there's, you know, I, I think there's little things. You give yourself an edge during certain times, and I don't think it's all been discovered. So, you know, my motto has always been, um, you know, if it's not working, try something new. And, and, you know, one story that brings me back to that, um, was, you know, dad was first mating for me on this trip and I had been banging these fish in this outside bin on an L on a group of L dikes. There are four L dikes. And I mean, we were smoking big fish every day on these guide trips and I'll never forget it. I made it my way down there that morning and it was super foggy. So I, you know, we were going really slow and I got down there and I started marking, and there were no fish there. Marked all three dikes, didn't didn't mark a single fish I wanted to set up on. And I'm just, I'm kind of puzzled, you know, because they've been there every day. And so I just said, they didn't go far, you know. So I went across the river on the inside bend on this shallow, shallow flat. I just, you know, I got my side scan set out pretty far and I started marking a couple of fish right up against the bank and there was some kind of, you know, decent current coming through. And I got to this point where there were some wooden pillars with a little brush on it stuck to it. And, and I marked, you know, several fish behind that. I went up and I'm in two foot of water and I throw my anchor out and it just goes right in the mud. I mean, it's just, you know, I can see it and I tie it off and I can always tell when my dad is just, he doesn't have any faith in what I'm doing. Like, you know, he's just, he doesn't even get up. Not going to help me bait. Not going to help me. He's, he's just, well, this is dumb. I'm going to sit right here and I'm I'm like, okay. So I, I get up and I bait all the rods and I throw them all out there. And next thing you know, this tail comes up and just starts 
going like this on the surface and the rod just slams down and it it was a 57 and we caught a 52 30s and 20s and and you know just doing something kind of off the wall they didn't go far but they were sitting in you know three four foot of water on a on a you know on a on a really uh foggy morning cold morning and why they were in there in that shallow water i still don't um you know just go try something new if if what you're doing all day and that's that's one of the things i really push in my seminars and stuff is most people get trapped into spot fishing well, like this spot or this spot really paid off for me and mm-hmm. and if it's not working go do something off the wall that you wouldn't think of um and you're gonna learn something you know most of the time you know don't get stuck in well they did this you know last year or i've caught them here or there just keep going to the same spot and sit in four or five hours so 30 minutes move on and if that's not working try something completely different because you're going to learn something that's something i really press in my you know seminars is is if, if you're not catching fish anyway you might as well be learning something so is there a certain amount of time, like whether it's a tournament or you're guiding and kind of like the story you said where, and I did it last year at MRM where I had a spot that I had spot fished for two years and it produced really well. And then for two days, just couldn't do anything on it. Just, they just, well, there were no fish there and right. started looking a few miles down river and then came on those fish. So, I mean, they're, they're, I think, like you said earlier, they move a lot. You know, you got to be willing to move and get off that spot that you caught that 100 at or that 80 or your PB. Like, you know, don't always just go to that spot. What's – if if you're not good on your sonar and you're fishing a spot and you ain't like Brian, what? how long do you stay before you make that move? It depends on the time of the year. I mean, like if we're dealing with temperatures over 65 degrees, I'm probably staying tops 20 minutes. If um, if we're dealing with colder water temperatures and I'm confident in what I marked, I might sit a lot longer. You know, if they're the fish that I'm pretty confident I'm after, I might sit 45 minutes to an hour if it's, you know, the fish I know. But, you know, in, in the colder water. But most of the time, I would say 20 to 30 minutes and, and, and if I don't have any kind of action, I'm out of there. And, and I'm always using my sonar. You know, people always ask, what are you looking for? I mean, catfish are, are, are pretty big creatures, the ones we're looking for. I mean, you can mark them unless they're laying in the mud. And if you're not marking any fish, you're looking at, you know, prime waters, you look shallow, you look deep, you looked on rock, you've looked on mud, you've been to outside bends, inside bends, you know, kind of breaking the river apart. If you're not marking anything, my recommendation is to start fishing structure, you know, fishing ledges, wood, rock on drops in current, that kind of situation, you know? So most of the time that happens for me is when there's a real sharp rise and there's a lot of debris in the water, those fish are sitting there the whole time and they're doing this, they're breathing, you know? And so a fish to take in all that debris when a rising river shooting up, and there's a lot of debris and silt and coming through the water. So a lot of times in those situations, they'll move really tight to structure. They'll move right up against the dikes. They'll move right below a, a submerged tree or rock pile in a drop, in a back eddy, that kind of thing, taking all that in. So when you're not marking any fish and you've got to rise, let's start fishing really tight to structure. Does that make sense? That's, yeah, that's some really, I'm, I'm, I'm putting that in here. That's some really good stuff. What's cool is this podcast has been live for an hour and a half. So there's some people going to have to dig deep in here to, to, as it goes further and along, it gets, you know, more detailed and that's some really good advice. So water going down, you're, they're going more towards water. the channel. They're going... Yeah. There, there's, there's no absolutes in catfishing. And I can't emphasize that enough because I couldn't tell you how many times the water's been dropping especially in the summertime and those fish up on the ledge on the bank, you know, really tight. But typically the rules that you want to abide by is the rising river. You want to go out towards the new water and, and fish, you know, more of the edges, right? When the, when the water's falling, you want to push more towards the channel, right? Just, those are just um, kind of guidelines, loose guidelines of kind of what you should do right? Those are the areas you want to look at first. But 
a lot of times in the summertime and in, in winter and, and, you know, X, Y, Z in between, there's a lot of other factors you have to take into account, account for why the fish are, you have to look in the summertime at oxygen. You know, you want faster moving water or more turbulent water that's going to put more oxygen in that hot water. And that's where a lot of times your bigger fish are going to want to be is the more oxygenated water. So you might be looking at, you know, a turbulent seam or more on the bank, um, you know, right behind a spillway or some kind of, you know, turbulence that maybe a narrower se section of the river or um, a more erratic bottom that's going to produce more turbulence, put more oxygen in the water, that kind of thing. So in the wintertime, you know, I'm looking at a lot of the secondary currents like the back eddies, uh, seam, just maybe slower water um, just outside of the current or even dead water. So um, there's, there's loose guidelines, but there's no absolutes, but you can, you can kind of go off of experience or just, you know, you know, just kind of common sense type things that tell you where to start and then go. Um, in a river situation, there, there, there's constant change. So, I mean, we're, we're always trying to establish a pattern of that day. You know, it's not just, um, and that pattern can change throughout the day. You know, a lot of times, this time of year, I'm looking in the holes first thing in the morning when it's cold, starting off kind of in the deeper water in, um, you know, the back eddies or the slacker water, you know, right around the dike. And then as the sun gets up, if it's a sunny day and starting to warm it up, I'm going to push back more into the flats in between the dikes and how you set up, how you cut bait. Everything is important when it comes to catfishing. A little things um that that can make you effective in how you set up and fish for these fish and one of the biggest things that i'm and i'm just i know i'm rambling but one of the biggest things that i see with my clients in the boat um this time of year why they're missing or not catching fish is because they are so impatient with the bite of a wintertime blue I use the lighter rod tips the medium action rods you know i use twc the whisker whips um, and, and, a, and a softer rod, especially when you're using braid, is very important. If you're using mono, you can get away with a stiffer rod. But you want to be patient with that bite because a lot of times they're hitting it and kind of letting it go and, and just kind of feeling if it's a trap or not, especially those bigger fish, the more experienced ones, unless they're really feeding. But I see most people want to grab that rod as soon as it's getting pulled on a little bit and hold it go way too early on those fish. And as you've seen, I'm sure blue cats need, you know, more time. You've got to give them time to let them take it and actually pick it up and swim with it before you reel down or set the hook on a fish. And most of the times when, when it's a great bite and fish are slamming rods down, he's catching fish. But most of the time, that's not the bite we have. We have a more um, reluctant bite you know, a softer bite. And that's when, you know, I come in and be like, I'll see somebody at the ramp be like, how'd y'all do? You know, oh, we struggled today. We, they were short biting or, you know, we didn't get them and we caught 15 fish. They weren't patient with that bite. And almost all the, the guys who are, you know, um, you know, they got socks older than me, you know, the old timers I get in my boat who, you know, especially when I looked like I was young, be like, i you know, I've got underwear older than you, boy. What are you doing telling me what to do? And yeah. they all want to grab that rod and feel and wait for that fish to, and, and I'll, they're always running to the rod way too early. And it's, it's a guide's headache, but that's, so that's, that's I think true. that's probably one of the biggest reasons people struggle on a, on a slow bite day or a, a finicky bite day. So th this is the question that I got for you. So there's been a few times, and I'm I'm trying to pinpoint it if it's really the certain time of year, but that I've I've went out and, and pre fishing in a tournament, and you know you're bumping, and I you call it the short bite. You know what what is going on where, you know you just you can't like they're just short biting so bad you just cannot get them. Like, is there yeah. what do you do in that? What do you do in that situation? Um, do you it, slow down it, and it let them? You, 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 um, you make your bait smaller for one, um, always, you know, and, and my favorite bait in that situation is a skipjack about, you know, this is long and just cutting them right behind the gills. Cause you know, that bait's going to stay on. Um, more importantly, 
if I can, I'm going to free line the bait to the fish and I'm going to reel on it. And if that's not working, I'm switching to octopus hooks and I'm setting the hook on them as soon as they hit. Um, that is a really super frustrating bite. And we get it a lot on our, on our bodies of water around here, especially in like late July and August. Um, you'll get, you'll get those kind of neutral to negative feeding fish that you're putting right in their face and you feel thump, thump, and as soon as it starts to load, they let go and that they'll pick it up and they'll come right at you and then they'll spit it out. That's a super frustrating bite when bumping. And one of the that's best a, things you can do. Skill. Yeah. One of the best things you can do is free line it to the fish and just let them have it. Or if that's not working, you, you switch the hooks. And as soon as you feel it, you reel down and set the hook. You're not going to get them all, but you're going to catch a lot more of the ones that are, because they all, they, it seems like they all get the men, memo. I always tell my customers, you know, on those really tough bite days, not to lose hope. You know, there's, there's always just like everything in the world, there's window lickers out there. And for one of those, we're going to, we're going to target that, you know, there's, my favorite fish, my favorite two types of fish are, are big and dumb. And uh, they're out there, the ones that didn't get the memo. So you just keep pushing. So that's what Mike was saying. How do you tell bumping when they're short biting? Like, do you reel down or just let them load up? So that, that was some good info. Is that, On is that, that Mike Mitchell? Huh? Yeah, is that Mike, Mike Mitchell? Mitchell? No, disregard all that, Mike. You What you want to do is you always want to just set the hook as hard just as you can. Set the hook as hard yeah. as you can. Yeah, hard so, as you can, Mike. It happens to me. It cost me a bunch of tournaments. Still learning, he said. See that? For, for those of you that are watching, Mike Mitchell just literally said it happens to him a lot in tournaments. And he's he's still learning. And he's just, in this video, which you can't see on my other screen, he looks like he's 12. In this, I mean, and he's been doing this a while. so And he's still learning. So something I want to ask you about also is is tell me about the, the bump bite. You know, when the different types of bite. Like, do you know when it's a big bite? Like every once in a while yes. you always hear that person that they're, they're walking bait and it's like, Oh, it's like it's a big one. Like they just, they could feel it like just bite down on yeah. it. How, what do you kind of walk through that? Oh, um, your, your twisted cat tournament, um, on Lake of the Ozarks. Um, you know, I, I was on those fish and, um, you know what we were actually doing and we had 30 boats around us all day. And what we were actually doing was, is we were hooking live gizzard shad on and bluegill that were, you know, pretty good size. And what, what we're doing is, is you'll feel that thump, 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 you know, and, and not every time, I'm not going to say a hundred percent of the time, like, so there's no absolutes in catfishing, but um, you can feel thump, 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 thump. But when you feel that big fish hit, he's just sucking it in it and it, it shakes the whole rod. And so what I want to do then is I want to freeze. That's what I tell all my people is just freeze. And what is, what's going to happen is he's going to start pulling with that live bait. We actually had to, cause I, most of the time I bump with my thumb on the spool and the bail open and I just drop my rod and just start feeding him line until I feel like he's turned and he's got that bait in his mouth. And then I'm going to reel down on him. And that was a really hard thing for Jackson and, and, and Jeff to kind of, so we missed, we missed quite a few big fish in that tournament, but we ended up, you know, hooking the two and ended up, you know, winning it. But that's just kind of the, the presentation that, um, that it, it varies is what I'm saying. So there's times when they're neutral like that, um, like what you're talking about in in the summertime. So, being proficient at bumping means a lot of things. I mean, all comes down to the feel, you know, and that's something I can't teach people. I, I bring people on and I tell them all the time, you know, I'm going to teach you the fundamentals of bumping. I'm always going to start them out for the heavier weight so they know what the bottom feels like and they can get that down because that's important. You've got to keep that bait in the strike zone and you have to know when you have a drop. There's little subtle things that you learn over time. Like when there's a drop, there's a little pull. And you just, you know, to let line out and get it. And the faster you realize that, the faster you're putting that bait in those fish's faces that are sitting in that drop. Because it doesn't take much of a drop to hide an 80-pound fish. A one-foot drop to go. You know, the 
the the um, shape of a blue cat, the way his face is is kind of shaped down like this, all they have to do is bury their peck fins in the mud. And that river, the way their, their head shaped is just going to pin them right down to the bottom. And they can sit in all the current you want, exert any energy. So think about that. So, I mean, a one foot drop is plenty to hide a hundred pound catfish or, you know, just him sitting there chilling, you know, and, and um, you get those big enough drops, the current actually goes over, I don't know where it hits the back of that drop where it comes back up and actually comes back up river and they can be facing actually down river in those situations. If you can think wow. about it, like if that makes any sense. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways when you're bumping to present a bait and you really get a feel for what the bottom's like, you know, if it's rock, if there's wood and, and ultimately really proficient at it, you can kind of hop it up and know you're over a tree and then free spool it on the backside when you get up over it and get right behind it. And that's kind of where you start separating the men from the boys and, and producing more big fish in the bumping world. Is there a difference in your leader length, your dropper? Yes. Yes. Typically, um, you know, I watch a lot of what the bottom's doing. And, um, you know, if, if it's a really snaggy bottom, a lot of times I'm putting floats on my customer's baits. And, you know, that's something that you just keep their hooks up out of it. And there's a lot of time that's produced the day. Because if you watch your sonar, a lot of times these fish, especially, you know, even big fish, they'll be up off the bottom two, three, four foot. And you'll see it on your fish finder. So if you start seeing that, you want to make your, your weight leader longer and your regular leader longer. And sometimes you want to put a, a float. Um, sometimes they're right down in the mud. You start catching fish that are covered in mud. You want to shorten all of that, your length, you know, your, your leader to your weight, your leader to your hook. And, um, you know, you let the fish kind of dictate what you need to be doing. I mean, there's a rig that I kind of always start out with, but it might be a day on. And if my partner's catching them, you better believe, and I'm not, I'm looking at everything he's got going on in that rig. Don't be proud. If he's, if he's got, you know, a, a two inch weight leader with, you know, a four foot leader, guess what I'm going to be running. You know what I mean? But I think it's always good when you have partner that you kind of, you start off a little different. You know, it's, it's, it's good to have that variance, but once you, I mean, you've got to look at everything in this because these things, you know, how, when some days when you know that, you know, you're both pretty equal in fishing and one guy's just catching all the fish for it you know it's some little subtle variance maybe it's you know you're 300 pounds and he's 140 and you know the boat's <laughs> a little different up in the air or what have you i don't know what it is but start thinking about why he's doing it and and looking at everything he's got on his rig because it, it could be you know simple and you guys could start catching a lot more fish so look at every aspect of it you know don't be too proud to say hey what are you running over there you know, let, let's, let's, let's yeah. do this thing. You know, let's work as a team. So I mean, you have a lot of anglers that use the same rig, you know what I mean? So they're tying the exact same rigs and they're the not using anything different. Every time. Yeah. And, and I look at those guys and I'm thinking, you know, you're going to do fine most days, but there's, you know, there's, there's different ways to bump too. You know, you look at a guy like Ben Goble, Ben Goble bumps really fast and he has a different presentation. And there's, there's days that Ben Goble will throttle him and we're struggling. Or there, there's different ways to bump. And one thing that's kind of a trick of the trade that I've, I've discovered over the years is usually when you get in the softer water, the slower water, more, you know, jigging and bumping like that, you know, it makes a big difference uh, in getting kind of a reaction bite in a slower water setting. In a faster water setting, it's a, I think it's a more natural presentation most of the time. But, yeah, but I think, good. I mean, that's good. That's good. That info. fast presentation, mm -hmm. that fast presentation of gobles is, 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 re, you know, it's initiating a reaction, you know, kind of a feeding response. And I think sometimes when they're really catching fish, I think that's a good way to go. Yeah. I've not seen Ben bump, but I've seen George Young bump and it looks like he's whipping a horse and building. <laughs> Very, aggressive. Very aggressive. I mean, crazy, you know? Yeah. There, there's different strokes and different ways for, for everybody. And, 
you know, um, do what, do what suits you afraid to mix it up. And like I said, when there's days when you're not catching them, mix it up and you, you're going to learn something, you know, try something different, try something out of your comfort zone. That's a good idea. That's so I had another question actually come up and it's, it's the Jackson was always the one saying it. I don't know where it came from, but it's kind of along the lines of, you know, if you're catching a lot of fish, but they're maybe in the, the tens, the twenties, the thirties, and you're looking for that big fish and people leave. And he always would say, don't leave fish to find fish. So I don't know if that's something that you guys used to say back in the day, but you know, I've, I've heard that a lot. What's your thoughts on that? Do you think big fish are in that area? Do you think, 20s hanging catching, together, 40s hanging together. If you're catching together. 30s and stuff, yeah, if you're catching 30s and stuff, I would say there, there's most likely, you know, a big fish in the area. Um, but, for, you know, big fish to me are more of a spot within a spot. So let's say we're drifting below Alton Dam, right? And you know there's there's big fish there and you're catching a bunch of fish, right? But they're the 15, 20 occasional 30 stuff like that so a big fish spot to me is a spot within the spot of where those fish are so what i'm looking for is a rock hump uh, a piece of wood stuck on rock a channel edge you know structure i'm looking for structure i'm looking for the spot within the spot and i'm trying to hit it you know downstream from there that i've caught i don't know how many 50 60 70 pound fish in tournaments, out of tournaments, on guide trips, what have you. And it's a brush pile, you know, and it's it's on this big flat. And it's just a kind of a lone brush pile. It's a it's a piece of structure that, you know, that holds big fish. And not all of them will. But when you can find kind of a uniform area and then a piece of structure within it, you know, an area that holds fish, but then a piece of structure that's different and that's something that, if I'm the big dog in the area, I can pull up. This is a prime feeding location. It's mine. That's what you want to start. You got to kind of put that all together, you know, whether it be a ledge or a certain drop with a log or a rock pile on it or what have you, but you've got to start thinking about, I've got to get good at using my electronics, that kind of structure, and then being your boat control. Boat control is one of the things that you know, most guides never get asked about one of the most important things. If you're going to become a good fisherman, you know, a good tournament fisherman, you've got to, you've got to get really precise with your speed, your boat control. Cause if you're going through an air crab and, you know, like this, what's your bait doing? You know, it's going, these fish are smelling our baits before in a bumping situation before it gets to them. And what we're trying to do is make it as easy as possible for those fish to find our baits before it gets by, gets by them. Because once it gets by them, it makes it really fine it again. So I'm trying to make it as easy as possible by going in a straight line right to the, the structures that I'm trying to hit and presenting that bait as natural as possible to that fish. And that's going to put more big fish in the boat for you. Do you think there's a certain speed that you try to target when you're doing that? You know, I'd say a good, you know, a good uh, represent or just average is cutting the turn, you know, the speed in half, but that, that doesn't always fly. I mean, like there's some summers in St. Louis where the water gets really hot, where I think you need to be bumping at 1.8, two miles an hour and be drifting. You need to be going 2.4 to almost three, you know, but there's other times of the year, like right now, I'd want to be going like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.7, somewhere in there. So that's, it's not always indicative of, a time of the year or a certain water temperature. You just kind of got to figure out. I, it's the same thing with the water falling. I've got places I'm going to start and then I'm kind of going to see what the fish want. If I know I'm going over fish and over, I'm marking them and I'm putting it right in front of them and you maybe they're short biting, you know, I might be mixing a few things up to kind of try to entice those fish to go. I might start going faster. I might start jigging it more. I'm going to try different things. And if that's not working, you know, I'm going to change my hook or, um, you know, try a different cut of bait or a, or a different area. So, you know, it, it, always changing. 
that that's that's good that's some good advice uh josh says when you're targeting that piece of structure and spot locking above it you know so many feet is how that's a waiting game how long will you wait there um you know if, if i'm right on the structure and i've got my line counters and i know i'm dialed in and i can feel that structure i mean if it's you know like summertime you're you're within five ten minutes but i'm still giving it 15 20 you know and if i don't have any action what i like to do in that situation is i might cast out my side rods on the side i'm going to walk one back i'm going to hit the structure you know if it you know and, and that's a also picking the right weight if i have the right weight the rod down and leave it there where i know it's in front of that fish you always got to think you know if i'm in 30 foot of water and it's 100 foot back i need to be at at, at, at the most 115 to be right on that fish. So I'm going to try to set it down at 110. You know, I always want to be short of the fish. Ask him, you know, that's game over. He has no idea it's in the world, right? So you always want to be short of that fish. So I'm walking a bait back. I'm going to stick it in well before I know it's to him, right? So to make sure he's smelling it. So then I'm going to pick up another rod and I'm going to walk back to him. And I might walk that one right to where I think he is and, 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 and try to feel the structure. You know what I mean? And, and, and set that one down. And if this one hasn't been bit or my side one hasn't been bit, I'm going to pick this one up, walk it back just a little bit, maybe jig it, pop it up and down a little bit. So I'm going to go back and get a drink, you know, think about life. And, and if nothing happens, then I'm going to pick this one up. I'm going to walk it back and just make sure I'm in that structure and then I'm going to probably give him 15, 20 minutes and then I'm going to head out. That's some really good advice right there. That's some good info. Uh, I had somebody ask, what about water temperature? Um, you always hear, I don't know where it comes from, but you always hear like 50, 50 degrees is the sweet spot, like where you can start walking baits. What's your thoughts on that? You know, I've always said, um, you know, 60, 60, where I start moving baits and that that's not indicative of what a catfish, you know, will eat at. I mean, there's guys bumping and catching fish right now, you know, I mean, with a 40 something degree water temperature, they'll obviously hit it. Um, and that they'll, they'll move on baits. But for me, you know, bumping with clients is a really hard thing to do. Uh, I don't know how global does it, um, you know, it's, it's something that's kind of almost a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two to really teach them effectively without just being the guy who hooks all the fish and hands it to them. Cause I don't, and that's what Google's doing. I just, I'm impressed with how he does, you know, he does it with large groups and you know, it's, it's, it's really tough for me. Like I'll take two maximum on a bumping trip unless the third guy's going to sit there and watch and rotate in. Because ultimately what's going to happen if you're wanting them to catch the, they're going to be hung up nonstop. You're going to be retying their stuff while they're hanging yours up. And cause it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all about feel. And, and if you've never done it, you don't have it yet. And it's, it's something that really takes some time to get to learn. And it's an intensive process. So if you're going to come on a bumping trip with me, come with one other buddy. I'll teach you guys how to do it. I can manage it. We'll catch some fish. Everybody will have a much better experience. Um, but, you know, as far as, you know, the bumping and everything goes, it's in moving baits. I really like it to be that 60 to 65 when fish are more active and willing. to. I think until then, if you're really good at spot locking and targeting um, groups of fish or fish feeding on a flat or, um, what have you, I think you're going to have a more productive day, um, kind of spot locking or, you know, slowly walking baits or, you know, just set on these fish that way. Then, um, but once they move out into the channel or on the outsides of the dikes and, um, they get into those feeding positions, um, it, you know, it's, it's time. So I, I, there, like I said, there's question. no absolute. One more question on bumping. Someone asked, when you're fishing with a buddy, do you recommend using the same weight or different weights to stay close or away from each other? Different weights, always. Um, I like 
I like to use different weights to get a more staggered approach. Um, you know, the men one of the best at that. And, and they're actually ones who kind of enforce that with me is, you know, um, Daryl will bump further back than Jason. Um, they have line counters. They, you know, if Daryl misses a fish or hits a, a tree or something like that, he'll tell Jason hit a tree at 154. Jason's back 132. He knows he's got 22 foot until he hits a fish or a tree. You know what I'm saying? So, and also it keeps it staggered. So you guys aren't drifting because the current wants to suck everything back to the middle like this. So if you guys are using the same weights and you hit a fish, you know, might run you into his line. You're both tangled up, lose the fish, or, you know, you both hit the tree at the same time, or, um, you know, you get hung up or, or, you know, tangled together. So I always like to use different weights. And, and a lot of times I've seen it uh, several times. We'll have a guy, I'll start him out, you know, bumping a heavy weight. And that the angle of the line into the water a lot of times has something to do with the presentation and that, that heavier weight that's closer to the boat will catch more fish because of the presentation of it. Most of the time in my experience, and that's a little further out with a little more scope. And I like to be at least 150 to 200 foot back because I feel like your line's more at an angle. And when you hit a piece of structure, you can pull it back and get it up over it easier than if you're straight up and down. And once you hit it, you've got to come straight up. And I think it hangs a little easier that way. But me personally, I like to be a little further back there, but I have found that there's times where they like a different presentation with the more straight up and down. Uh, Kevin asks, what is your choice of bait at different times of year? Um, again, loose guidelines, but like this time of year, uh, I most of the time wouldn't give you a nickel for a skipjack, but, um, you know, give you a buck or two a piece for a, a good gizzard shed. And, um, you know, as we go into April, um, you know, I, I gizzard shed, I'm starting to use moon eye, some, um, buffalo, black buffalo carp, quill back, uh, common carp, uh, that time of year. Um, as we get more into May, um, starting to, to transition more to moon eye and skipjack, um, summertime can back, you know, to a little bit of carp, um, sometimes some shad moon eye skipjack really is pretty good in the summertime out here. And then as the water temperature gets 80 or better, um, I really start liking Asian carp a lot of times, um, big head start using those size on those are the ones that you know are you know eight 10 inches or less um that's my favorite size on those and then um you know starting to go back into the fall start with the uh, moon eye skipjack again you know in, in september october and uh trans into shad no chicken uh you know i've used it i've used it brian Nagy's a good buddy of mine and you know, he told me, he's like, you got to try it. And I've, I've used it back several years and it catches fish. I haven't caught any big fish on it, but it does catch fish. I always put it in some kind of sugar-free cherry Kool-Aid with some, um, you know, some food coloring. So people in some people are like, is that chicken? No, nah, it's not chicken. Don't worry about it. But yeah, it's, uh, it, it works. They'll eat it. Blue cats will eat it. I mean, I don't, I'm not a big, I'd much rather have some fresh, you know, but there's times, especially drifting in the summertime when there's so much pressure. That's when I started using it was just something different. And it catches fish. Yep. <clears throat> Next question. What is your favorite stretch of the Mississippi river? Man, I get that question a lot from my uh, clients and, I really don't have a favorite stretch other than the one that they're biting on right now. Like I, I like all of it. Um, I really haven't found a stretch of the Mississippi. I don't like, I'd say there's certainly times like downtown. Um, I get pretty tired of downtown St. Louis at times. It's an awesome place to catch fish. We have a ton of granaries, but I fish it so much. I like to get out of it and see different parts of it. 
So there's there's times that's um my least favorite, but other times where I know I can just fish and and um, have people have a really good time. It's neat to be fishing in front of the arch and see all that stuff. I have a lot of fond memories there, but um, I really like the Memphis area. I've I've got to fish Helena. I, I like that slower, deeper water at times. I just like seeing it all, you know, like, it, and it's got some current, you know, the Mississippi River is just an awesome fisher. I don't think there's really a bad stretch of it from Alton down to the ocean. I, I like all of it. I know a lot of people in the last year or two, I know, I know Riddle's been doing a lot of it, but i uh, been fishing further south and going to Venice and, do you think like the lower water that we've had the last two years, especially like extreme low water has helped push lots of fish and congregated down lower, like in the new Orleans area, you got helps that know, bite down there. That's an area, you know, a lot of us have all talked on and fishing and just haven't made it down there. And, you know, there's a lot of areas that, um, you know, a lot of the guys who use the techniques we use haven't really gone and, and pressured, you know. So um, I think that area this year kind of experienced a perfect storm. I think there's always a really good population of good size, hungry fish. I think there's some giants down there probably and, and a lot of fish that have, haven't seen a lot of the techniques we, we use. Um, so I think it's probably a tremendous fishery. But I think this year it kind of experienced a perfect storm with the low water, the salt water pushing up, you know, people experiencing um, their drinking water around New Orleans. I think maybe it forced a lot of fish from, you know, let's say Venice up north to that area. And you had all the grain that they normally would congregate around in the fall. And I think it kind of created a perfect storm of just an unreal bite, and a tremendous amount of fish in that area. Now, I could be off base. I've never fished it myself personally. That's just kind of my take on maybe what happened this year. But I think anybody who has a tournament or goes down there and fishes can probably expect some pretty good fishing. I mean, like we were talking about earlier with uh, techniques and, and, and starting to fish a new area that the fish aren't, you know, accustomed to some of the techniques we use and the equipment we have and how to find them and, you know, the, just their overall knowledge. Uh, um, I think you're going to find you're going to do fairly well in, in those areas down there. So as we're, as we're talking about techniques and tournaments and all that, what are your thoughts? I mean, obviously there, Kevin Parks has got this giant river board that people are dragging baits up river in current, uh, you know, and people are doing spot lock. There's so many different ways to catch fish which is awesome. What do you, do you, do you think live scope front facing sonar, do you think that'll affect how we catch fish? Do you think that'll give an angler an advantage? You know, it's, it's really starting to affect the bass world. And I've been watching podcasts where they talk about, you know, there's a new guy in the sport that just came on and he is killing it, but it's just fine. Well, Josh Jones is very good. I mean, I mean, I think right now he's, he'd have like a, a trip cancel and I don't, I don't know if they're two hour trips or he's just showing you how to use live scope and it's yeah. like $2,000. It's like gone. I mean, a minute. Yeah. So like, but that's, that's yeah. different. Yeah. That's more clear water too. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, you think that's something that'll I change? definitely, I definitely think there is, um, there's a lot to that. There, there's a lot of new techniques and, and, um, kind of uh, niches with the live scope that haven't really surfaced. You know, I think there's guys keeping, you know, some things quiet. I think there's an aspect to live scope me personally in a lot of situations where I feel like catfish feel um, the pinging from it. Like I honestly think um, they can sense it. There's, I think there's um, situations like in shallow water um, with your range out, I think where you can, you can pick on some fish or maybe a drifting situation where you might be able to stop on some structure in the right current. I think there's going to be some situations where um, tournament anglers especially uh, put some extra fish in the boat, but solely designing, um, you know, a, a strategy on it. 
I'm not going to say it's going to be the most consistent or effective way to target these fish, especially in a river type setting, maybe in lakes um, and and, um, backwaters and things like that. But um, as of right now, I think, you know, targeting individual fish, um, you know, but then again, going down to like three fish tournaments and things like that for three bites in a day, um, you know, could it, could it, you know, be a factor? Absolutely. You know, where you could actually target the right three fish and make them bite. I think there are guys that could get good enough to where it could be a, a really, you know, a deciding factor in a lot of tournaments. Yeah, I mean, as a tournament director and a tournament angler, I mean, that's obviously I, I just got live scope on my boat. So I'm excited to try that out. And I do personally know a few people that one's on a river, one's on a lake, and they're they're doing well. I, like the one I showed you, uh, he's using um, a huge spinner bait, and he's just, I mean, just j- like right straight down in the front of his boat. That's on a lake. Um, but again, I don't know. I mean, I, especially in the backwaters, you know, when you're when you're using your side scan usually by the time you're seeing those fish, it's kind of too late. You can maybe bring a planter board or something, but you know, if you're, right. if you're live scope, maybe in the front of the boat, you know, to the side and kind of pinpoint where that fish is and know that it's 25 feet out and you got a planter board, you can bring that in and you can almost like hit that fish. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think time will tell. I mean, I think that there's, you know, just like we talked also with tournament anglers, it, it's been tough since day one, but it's getting really tough now. And there's some really good anglers that a lot of people, like you said, don't know about that don't fish anymore. There's a lot of new guys on the scene. You know, I know you had your few, I had my few, um, but it's a lot of great anglers out there that are really putting the time in big. Time. Absolutely. It's, it's tougher now than it. And, um, you know, I would, uh, I would see nothing but it, it getting better and, and more guys laying awake at night thinking about how to catch them better. And, um, you know, it's just going to keep getting tougher and tougher and more things are, you know, new techniques are going to come out. And, you know, it's it's only going to get bigger from here. And it's as big as I've ever seen it. So, you know, nothing but positive things for catfishing if we can all keep our heads down and get along. 100%. And just like you were giving me crap the other night because you were you were talking about how I used to kind of have a participation award or participation <laughs> event. And, and, and what Ryan's talking about, and this is not against anyone or like what we used to do, but, you know, I used to have eight tournaments and, you know, it was the top six. So, you know, to become Angler of the Year, and, and I, I think I was Angler of the Year for Twisted Cat like in 2012 or something. <laughs> or got third and I only fished two tournaments, you know what I mean? But I was like the only few that fished two tournaments. So, you know, I made it starting last year hard and this year extremely hard. So, you know, nothing against John Jameson and Kevin Parks because they deserved it. But I think this year, you know, having four of your best 12 events. Yep. Tough. And like we talked about. That's a good way to do it. I mean, if you're, if you're having events everywhere, and let's say you have eight events and you're taking six of those, then it's a participation trophy, in my opinion. I mean, because not every, you know, 80% of the people aren't going to be able to make six events, you know, but four events out of 12, most people can make four. And you're starting to really whittle down to who's earning it. You know what I mean? Oh, I mean, you can yeah. still have guys fish 12 events and that gives them a lot more opportunity to do well. But, um, you know, it's, it's still, you know, four out of 12 is a pretty good deal. I like that. Yeah. It, you can't really see on the map behind me, but like the way that Twisted Cat was you know, put together this year is you had like almost four regions kind of with some that are in the, in the different areas where people have to go outside of what their home water might be, whether you're a Mississippi river, Illinois, upper Mississippi, Missouri, you know, Oklahoma lakes, Missouri lakes, Kansas lakes, but you got to be a really good angler. And that's what's, you know, I talked about Justin Clare. I talked about Dominic and Lance and Kevin and uh, John. There's anglers that are on there, like that are coming that this year, last year was really tough. But this year is is going to be like, there's going to be a lot of people, in my opinion, that will not make the championship because it's that hard to get into. 
which is, is what we want as a sport. That's and it makes want. it you know, more people putting in more time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there needs to be a, um, a good foundation of grassroots tournaments, anglers into the sport of tournament catfishing. And then there needs to be, you know, kind of a more elite that not just anyone can join. So there's stages for people to work up to and strive for and, and make it more competitive. You know, um, you need something out there that everybody can get and enjoy tournament catfishing. And then you need, you know, somewhere for them to go up from there and every for something for everybody to strive for. And I mean, I think that's where yeah. tournament catfishing has to go. I mean, I yeah, think there's a lot a good... out there that's set up like that, but I mean, I think that's ultimately yeah. where we're Yeah, we got a good two to, year, two to three year plan of growing to that. You know, we've got the grassroots thing going and we're going to more of an elite thing. But like I said, it's, it's Harold Dodds in. <laughs> uh, it's, it's fun to like to see that, but you know, I kind of put it together as an angler and also it's so much fun to see people going at it against each other and, and new anglers and, uh, there's a lot of great anglers out there. I'd love to see you one of these days get back into it for a year and see, you know, what it's like. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I get to fish a couple, maybe a year. I, I Roy and them, um, you know, let me come down and fish with them for monsters on the Mississippi. And we always have that. And, um, Tyler and I are talking about going and doing the mega bucks in Vicksburg this year. And, um, you know, Harold Dodd, that's a name we were just talking about earlier and over the weekend. It's a great, you know, one of the fathers of catfishing, in my opinion. He's a great guy. Yeah, he said, think like a fish. Good info, Ryan. No, Harold, I actually met Harold Dodd for the first time two years ago in Cape. I'm setting up, and this guy comes walking up to me and shakes my hand. Great guy. And he's asking me about the tournament and all this. I'm like, you know an awful lot of stuff about catfishing tournaments, like, who are you? And he's like, I'm Harold Dodd. And he kind of told me a little bit of his back history and pretty cool. Yeah, and so that's a, it's, a shame days, that like it's, going to water. it's a shame everybody doesn't know who he is. Cause he's one of the guys where our sport is what, where it's at. You know, he's one of those guys you put in with uh, Phil King and Virgil AG and, you know, John Jameson and Kaufman, all those guys, you know, he's, he's one of the guys that got us all stuck. Yeah. Harold, I'd like to have you on this show sometime on a Monday night. About the reach out to you. But yeah, no, there, there's a lot of good people out there. And like I said, it's uh, kind of what this show is bringing some of those people to light, you know, for an episode and, and talking about, you know, like what we did tonight is, you know, how you started and, and where you're going. And like I said, you've been in a long time, but you still got a long ways to go. And I'm sure you'll be guiding for a long time. You're still young, you know. Relative, relatively, yeah. Um, but like I said, I'm not smart enough to do anything else. So I'll be right here. Show me catfishing in St. Louis, you know, um, and enjoying it. Yeah, well, that's, that is good. What, uh, let's see, what else have we talked about or any, I'm just looking if there's any questions, anything that we've skipped. I think we covered talk it about? all. Alex. Um, Man, I wouldn't know her. I think I think we've done hammering it all out. Kayla Page just said, any advice on how to kill a big buck from the boat while targeting trophy catfish? <laughs> Man, I'll tell you right now. Um, no, I am a it is a great thing that I don't make a living from deer hunting because I would starve to death. I am terrible at deer hunting. Uh I learned that this year after spending way too much time chasing those things and them outsmart me at every turn. Luckily, everybody's like, well, you shot a big buck this year, man. I'm going to tell you, I had, I had two guys in my boat who are super nice guys. Uh, and, and Dwayne, I call him D Wayne and uh, Will and Dwayne were, they took mercy on me. I, I caught Will this 60 something pound fish. And he's like, you can come up and hunt with me anytime. And I said, well, you better be careful. I will. I will take you up on that. He's like, no, I'm serious. Super nice guy. Brings my arm, puts me in the dang shooting house, and all I had to do was pull the trigger. I mean, I had nothing to do with shooting that deer other than showing up. That was all Will. So those deer kicked my butt this year. I am I am learning. This is my – I learned – well, deer hunting, I took my boy a couple times. He doesn't like to fish. My boy's 18 now. He doesn't like to fish. 
but he would let me take him deer hunting. He had a buddy. Um, so I'm all in, right. I never deer hunted before. I went out and bought a 243 for him, all the deer hunting stuff, went down to some property my grandpa owned and we got him his first deer one the next year and then nothing the next year. And then I had a buddy who lives up here who I took fishing, um, who was like the property owners of this 850 acres right by my house was like, um, they're wanting a youth hunter this year. Do you know anybody? And I was like, I actually know the right. He shot this 143 inch buck and that thing had me shaking like a damn leaf. Yeah. <laughs> he, he gets, he gets his gun up. I'm like, there he is. You know, there's, we saw antlers in the scrape and he gets the gun on him and, and, and I, and, um, I'm like, hold on, you know? And I was like, wait until you get it. I had put the binox on him and I'm like, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him. <laughs> I, he, that deer gave me the buck fever and it was over after that. I started hunting those dang things and they've taken up way too much of my, uh, my, my mind and my time, but I love it. It's my, it's my vacation, you know, kind of a way, but I enjoy it. I'm not very good at it but I enjoy it. I think that's almost what I like yeah. about it is I'm, <clears throat> I'm learning a lot. And my buddy, um, Mike uh, Halsey, thank you for letting Hunter always come out and hunt. And he lets me come out and hunt now too. Shout out. That's gotta be awesome too, to, to be able to get, you know, to have the friends to, to, to take you to other places to go hunt and, you know. That, that's one of the great things about guiding. You meet a lot of great people who are into the outdoors and, you know, most of those people are just super fine people who are willing to open up their homes and, you know, um, just like-minded people who are really, you know, good people. Meet a lot of those in what I do, which I'm very fortunate for. And the yeah. other upside to being a guide is you get to try deer jerky and, and sausage sticks and all that stuff from all over the country, which I'm a bit – if you come oh, out I on bet. a trip with me and you got some deer sausage jerky – just bring a couple extra pieces for the captain because I'm I'm gonna be eyeing it. I'm gonna I'm gonna be sitting there looking at you like, hey, you gonna share that? <laughs> so I'll, I'll I'll ask you just one last question. We've been at it for two hours fifteen minutes, which is awesome. I appreciate you being on the show. But Absolutely. I'll ask Ryan this question, and then everybody can else can answer it. And then we've already got another one, another feed where we ask this question. Uh, so put your Put your answers also in the comments. Um, so, Ryan, this Saturday, Alton, Illinois, 3 fifth. what is your thoughts for a winning bag? Big fish in total weight. Well, it, it really – I know it warms back up. Wednesday, we got a cold front coming through. Um, That's a nasty cold front, too. Yeah, it goes from 80-something – but then it, it kind of stays in the 50s, and then I think, what is it, Saturday, almost 60 again or 55, yeah. something like that. That's, that's three days after the front. With it being that kind of front, I'm going to say my prediction is the three biggest, right? Yep. Three biggest. I'm going to say 147 pounds. 147, what would you say big fish is going to be? Mm, 86. Ooh, that's a good one. That's, yeah, you know I what that is? A... You know what that is? What? That's a creature. Uh, a what? A creature. A creature? Remember? Oh, yeah. Don <laughs> that, That's big enough to smash, uh, scare a small child. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so when you when you yeah, so put your guesses in here and whoever is the closest will will send you a twisted cat hat. And then when we're done with this podcast, which is gonna be here just in a few minutes, get on there, go to the Don Sweets channel and watch some catfishing America videos, and you're gonna fall in love with him. I promise. He's got two seasons, I think, on YouTube. And they're incredible. Did we almost watch a whole season on Saturday night? I mean, we watched several. Yeah, we it took you right back. Yeah. So, hey, uh, everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. Ryan, thank you so much for being on. Uh, if you're looking for a guide trip from Ryan Casey, show me catfishing. Uh, you can reach out to him on his Facebook page. 
and uh, go for the trip of a lifetime. Me and you haven't went yet, so hopefully I get to go with you. Sometime. No. Uh, yeah, the John Ed and them are coming out this year, and uh, you're more than welcome to join along for that. And then, yeah. plus, you get out there and do some fishing. But uh, I really appreciate yeah. you. I enjoyed it. And uh, thank you all for listening to me babble. Yep. So, everybody, have a good night. And uh, thanks for watching. Hopefully, we see you this Friday night at the Best Western premiere for our non mandatory captain's meeting. And you can still register. And also, Saturday morning, you can register. But we'll take off at the Alden Amphitheater parking lot, which is on Henry Street. And uh, three big fish. Going to be fun time. So, everybody, enjoy the rest of your week. Good luck and be safe out there, everybody. <laughs>